Welcome to a new episode of B&B Movie Reviews. This week, we crash land 65 million years ago, go on the hunt with Idris Elba, take on a mystery in Boston, and get stuck inside with Willem Dafoe. Stay tuned. B&B is up next. Let's get to an escape vessel. Escape pods. Location unknown. We need to be quiet. Quiet. And move. I need to get us home. Home. Family. Ready? Run! <laughs> Adam Driver crash lands on Earth 65 million years ago with a cataclysmic media hurtling towards Earth. It's a race against time to save himself and the one lone survivor before sudden impact. All right, Brad, 65. Mm. So, Adam Driver. Yep, we love, love him. We love Adam Driver, love right? Love Adam Driver. Dinosaurs. Love dinosaurs. Put them together, what do we get? Uh, a really mediocre movie. Yeah. Um, this movie should be our jam. I love yeah. B movies of this nature where you have a visitor, he lands on Earth 65 million years ago, yeah. he has to fight T Rexes <laughs> and other creatures that I cannot identify. So many <laughs> gross bugs in this movie, yeah. a surprising amount of disgusting stuff that he yeah. must deal with. But it's a real snooze. It, there's not a lot going on. Like, there's not a lot of dinosaur fighting. There should be nothing but dinosaur fighting in this movie. You know, you know the thing that kind of, and maybe this, the one thing that kind of frustrates me, and it goes back, maybe this is my fault, is marketing and the trailers. And the way they yeah, kind of expectation sold. expectation is a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing, man, because I went into this movie with the expectation of like, okay, and, I, and I'm up here, you know, theorizing about what this movie could be, knowing that this is from the writers of A Quiet Place and how much I love that movie. We see the trailer, and I'm like, okay. And, and they, the way they sell it, it's like future meets the past. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, so we have a futuristic uh, explorer. Yeah, is this a Planet of the Apes situation? Exactly, I was thinking, is this a Planet of the Apes that goes through, goes through a wormhole and he goes back 65 yeah. million years? No? Like, no, and, but then I'm okay with that because if you tell me that, you know, we had, um, you know, uh, uh, space explorers and like a future, well, there's that bit in the movie ago. where they talk about how space is infinite, like all those stars out there, you, you can't count them all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, knowing that, as we do, it's easy to imagine that there was a society like ours from a different place yeah, that, that could develop the way that we did. But they don't really, but they don't go, really explore that. They don't go into that. There's Not no plot in this movie other than what we've already discussed. Guy crash lands on, on Earth 65 million years ago. The big one, the big yeah. meteor is coming. Yeah. He has to get off with his uh, ward in this movie. I think the big problem that this film has is mm. they create a communication barrier between him and the little girl. Yeah. And that means that for most of this movie, there's actually no communication happening. There's an attempt at it, there's a failing at it, but it's pretty silent, there's nothing engaging around their relationship. No. And I think because of that, we can't really engage with anything else going on on this planet. And then going to Adam Driver's character with that, because I mean, this has that kind of trope that we've seen actually recently, you know, the lone wolf and cub, you know, yep. with we've seen it with The Last of Us, The Mandalorian, we've seen it a lot, Pedro Pascal, I guess is, you know, kind of, you know, cornered the market on that. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, but we've seen that a lot and they don't really do anything new or interesting with that. But then like, even with his story of how they try to create his backstory in the beginning with his family and his, do and, and his daughter, and then what, happens with that and then trying to build a connection with this little girl but you're right that communication barrier you never get a chance to really see how they are really like connecting there's with not each enough other. here to fill 90 minutes Which maybe if this was a 75 minute movie it would be more passable yeah. but again 
you, they, they don't really have the budget to sell the idea either. You know, the dinosaur sequences in this yeah. are so lackluster. And of course, you know, when you think dinosaurs, you think Jurassic Park. Yeah. And it's unfair to place this movie under the shadow of that masterpiece yeah. that Steven Spielberg did. No, but even placing this movie under the shadow of the far inferior sequels of Jurassic Park, it doesn't live up, right? Like, it's just not exciting. And it's it so pains dull. Me. It pains me to say that, because I do not like those Jurassic World movies. But yeah, it doesn't really live up to even those movies, whether it's visually, aesthetically, or story-wise, or character-wise. Like, it just doesn't live up but to any of that. when you understand that the movie is a pandemic film, it is a lockdown film, mm. and that they made this movie, you know, at the heart of the pandemic. Okay. And I it, didn't know it that. really looks it when you consider that. Yeah, this has been sitting on the shelf for a little bit. It okay. feels like it's gone through several edits. <laughs> there are some really strange transitions in this film, and I yeah. think that's the result of a lot of tinkering. And then Adam Driver, like, there's points where he's uh, where he's communicating with the little girl, and he, he tries to come off as being funny, and it, it, it kind of shifts the tone a little bit, which is a little weird, where he tries to come off as, I, I don't know, I don't know if you saw that I, in the movie look, where it's To just, me, the, the, the failing in there is just... They're in a because they write this story where they can't actually speak to each other because they don't share the same language. Yeah. By putting another barrier between them, it puts a barrier between us between and us. the film. It, like I feel so distant to what's going on in this movie. Yeah, what's your rating for this one? Sadly, I have to give it a B minus. Yeah. We are the B and B show. We give yeah. things either a B plus if we like them or a B minus. If we don't, and I cannot recommend 65, so I got to give it a B minus. I agree. Um, I, I, was, I so wanted to try to give this a B plus. I was thinking that I might give it a low B minus. Either way, it's still a B minus. It's just it's not something I'm gonna go back to revisit anytime soon. So, yeah, those are our thoughts. Unfortunately, on 65, B minus for both of us. So stay right there. When we come back, Idris Alba comes back to a character, a beloved character from his BBC days, and a Luther. Each year, there are more than a dozen significant tropical and winter storms that threaten the East Coast. So chances are there will be more hurricanes and blizzards near here again. And between school, sports, and social lives, chances are you won't be with your kids when it happens. Will they know what to do? Ready.gov slash kids has all the educational tools and information to make the conversation easy. When the time comes, chances are they'll feel prepared, not scared. So talk with your family today. Who's this? You know who it is. Move! Move, oh, please! Go, 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 go. That's it. Let's go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop! Stop! Back. Back. Look at me. Look at me. Back. 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 Why would you say that? It's just, it's just about to get started. John Luther hunts down a serial killer while the police are hunting down John Luther in the Netflix, Netflix film Luther, The Fallen Son. Brian, that's a lot of Luthers. It's a lot of Luthers. That's a lot of Luthers. There's only one Luther in this movie, though. <laughs> There's only one Luther in this film. Uh, it's based on a television series. Yes. I never watched it. Did you ever watch I Luther? did. I did watch Luther years ago. I think I may have saw, like, the first two seasons. And the BBC have short seasons. So their seasons are, like, four, five, six episodes. I think, like, one season is two episodes. So they're extremely short. But so the, the seen... episodes are usually, like, three hours long. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but... But I have seen some episodes of the show, so I'm a little bit familiar with the character. Um, I wanted to kind of binge through the show to catch up with the movie. After seeing the movie, I'm kind of glad I did. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, like to me, after I finished the film, I was yeah. more curious about what okay. the Luther universe was like. Okay. Uh, this film, as you can see in that clip, is pretty darn disturbing. There are moments in The Fallen Sun yes. that shocked me. 
It's interesting, man, because I thought the same thing, especially with the opening scene and the first, and, the, and probably maybe the first 15 to 20 minutes of the movie, especially when we get the reveal of what the character of Andy Serkis is doing, and it's really sadistic. Yeah. But I, then I look for, at- Upsetting. It's very upsetting as well. But then I look at it from a filmmaking point of view and just the look and the feel and the aesthetic of it, and it feels very David Fincher light. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, uh, that's, you know, this is the, this is what I, I got. <laughs> that's, that's what I got from it. I don't know if that's fair, okay. but I also think that later on in this episode, I'm going to bring up David Fincher as well. Okay. Uh, so let's just get it out of the way. Um, I, I, I struggled with the opening of this movie as it was trying to set up where Luther is based on, I presume, where the show left the character. You know, same thing I was in jail. Yeah, same thing I was assuming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's weird is he's in jail, then this killer is doing his killer thing, yeah. and then he finds a way out of jail. That is so easy. It's like the most... Um, yeah. Uh, like lackadaisical prison break I've ever seen <laughs> in a movie. They just had to get Idris out from behind those bars, which I appreciate. Yeah. But I also kind of wish we spent more time with Idris in the prison. A little bit, just to show how difficult and how much of a struggle it was to get him to where he needs to be once he's out looking for this killer. But we don't spend that much time. So it, it felt like a roundabout way. You're right, it's, it definitely felt lazy because it's almost like, let's just get Luther out of the picture for the first act of the film, and then, okay, let's just bring him back so that we have a like reason for why. It must have why. been such an epic climax of that last season where it's like, oh my gosh, Luther's going to jail. I What's going to happen? I know. And then it's like, bye. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, and that's the same thing I thought. I was like, oh, this is interesting. It's like, wait. And that's why I wanted to see the show, because I'm like, if Luther's in jail, he has to break out. Is this where we leave him at the end of the series? But I, that, no, it's all within this. The, the, within Andy Circus, though, we both love Andy Circus. I love Circus. Andy Circus. We've met him. We, we have met yes. him a couple times. Yes. Thank you, San Diego Comic Con. Yes. Uh, so we're in the bag for anything this guy does. What do you think about his tone as the antagonist of this film versus Idris's tone as the protagonist? Uh, I feel like they're not really on the same wavelength. Yeah, I kinda are like, they in the same movie? Yeah, I know. I kind of like a little bit of what Andy Serkis is doing. You know, he's chewing up scenery. He's having fun with Super the Super watchable. Super watchable. That hair piece. I'm in awe of it. <laughs> I don't it is know, the man. monolith of this movie. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I saw that. I was like, ooh, okay, that's where we're going with this. Um, Love it. But it's interesting, although like I have a lot of issues with this movie, I actually thought that there was something interesting with playing with that idea of 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 the fear of the, the fear of shame and the fear of being caught as uh, being greater than the fear of death and and how he uses that um, against and against his victims. I thought there was something interesting with that idea, but ultimately it doesn't really you know, yeah, I, I, I don't think it comes together well at the end, especially how the film tries to incorporate and subvert the cerebral, the, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, oh, 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 Cynthia Erivo. Thank you, Cynthia Erivo. Yes. Uh, the way that it subverts her character at the end and sort of put, pits the two of them against each other, yeah. Idris and her. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't really go with that. I didn't find that to be an enjoyable twist to the narrative. Yeah. But, you know, halfway through that movie, when we are watching these people throw themselves off of buildings, you know, because of how they've been manipulated by the Andy Serkis character, yeah, it is, it is, it is a yeah. thrilling sequence, and it's a very scary and sequence. And like you say, it's upsetting. Yeah. Uh, what's your rating for this? Ultimately, it doesn't work, but maybe it would work better if I had a better understanding of the Luther series. But as someone who's never experienced it, yeah. I got to go B minus. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I'll say a B minus. I like act, I like some of the things they introduce as far as thematically with some of the ideas, but overall, it just all kind of like you say fall flat. So it's a B minus for me as well. All right. So those are our thoughts on Luther, the Fallen Son. So when we return, there is a new uh, mystery movie based on true events on Hulu. The Boston Strangler will be right back. When I got the opportunity to get her, there wasn't no choice. I told myself, I'm gonna take custody of my daughter. It's my baby. That's what we're supposed to do as men. Take care of our home, build a foundation, you know what I'm saying? Love, our money, 
She's my purpose. I'm here to walk with her, hold her hand until she can walk alone. Ain't nothing like being a father in this world. What you're feeling right now, that's every day for me. You know how many people I've gone down the rabbit hole with? It's a dead end every time with this case. You get your teeth into something and then your bottom falls out at three in the morning and you got nothing. Well, I'm making myself crazy. He's out there somewhere. Laughing at us. Loretta learns that her lead has gone cold when Detective Conley informs her that the suspect she's been pursuing is not the guy that they're looking for in the new murder mystery, Boston Strangler, currently streaming on Hulu. So, Boston Strangler, so this is, I guess, based, inspired on true events that happened in the early, mid-60s 60s, yeah. um, in Boston, and stars Keira Knightley, uh, Carrie, Carrie Coon, and Alessandro Navala. Uh, famously, I know from Face Off, uh, <laughs> Pollux Troy. I always, I always remember him. I wish we were watching Face Off. I know. Oh, oh goodness. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on this, man? You know, we're in an interesting era. True crime is so big right now, especially in the streaming space. That's true. There's a lot of these kinds of stories out there. Uh, I hate to be that person who compares one movie to another film. I hate those types of reviews. I am going to do that here because I could not get Zodiac out of my mind. I was thinking, the David I was, Fincher I was film thinking, yep. from 2007, a yeah. film that I would consider as a masterpiece. Mm. And I'm trying to figure out why do I love that movie? And I found this one so uninteresting. Okay. And I think it's because one, Zodiac has three perspectives. You know, it's got the reporter of uh, 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 Tony Stark. Oh my gosh, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Mark Ruffalo. Mark Ruffalo, yep. And it also takes a long period of time to show how the investigation infects those lives. Whereas in this film, we have two perspectives, the okay. two female reporters, and we have some sequences that, sh that are very uh, understated that shows that her marriage is in trouble okay. because of her giving all this time to the investigation. And then at the very end of the film, we get like a crawl that says, yeah, they got divorced. The, the, I, this is, just all feels like a rough draft of mm. these kinds of stories. Okay, so I guess th there's a blind spot for me because I, I, shame to say, I haven't seen Zodiac. No shame. Haven't I'm seen... not here to shame anybody. You should watch Zodiac. I know, I but know. That's okay. I, I need to watch because a I, lot of movies out there in the world. There, there is, there is. Um, but I haven't seen Zodiac, but I'm very familiar with the movie Zodiac uh, and the tone of that movie as well. And even watching Boston Strangler, it did kind of remind me of David Fincher and specifically Zodiac as well. But I don't know, like for me, I really enjoyed the movie because I enjoyed the journey of these two characters of Kara Knightley and Carrie Coon. And also, not just the investigative part of them searching for the Boston Strangler, but also just the workings in the newsroom, especially during this period of time and how dismissive and discriminatory it was against women in the, uh, in the newsroom at that time and them really fighting to, not just for Kara Knightley to get this story, but then to go as far as she went to try to unravel. Who I would the have liked were. more of that, though. Like mm. to me, okay. it, they they split the film between the investigation and the newsroom, mm -hmm. and I don't think either of them really has a lot of space within the screenplay. Okay, uh, and I just feel like that Kira Knightley. You know, doing her best Boston accent just never feels right for the part. Really? And I, I yeah, I just didn't, I didn't yeah. respond to it. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I, I really, I really, I really liked her character. I thought she did a really good job, especially with her Boston American accent. Okay. I did. I, I, I kind of got, you know, swept up into it. I thought Carrie Coon did a great job as well. Um, oh God! What, what was their boss? I mean, we've seen him in a lot of movies. I forget his name uh, offhand. I right, um, yeah. You're doing terrible with proper nouns today. <laughs> yeah, I know. But but I, th I I liked all the performances in this movie. And then again, going to the filmmaking, I loved 
the cinematography in this. Uh, you know, we talked about in previous episodes, we were talking about in our Black History Month, we were talking about um, Bradford Young and just like just that type of aesthetic where you have light and dark and that's the, the smoky uh, atmosphere. I thought that the the atmosphere that they created with the cinematography very lend to the story. I, Brian reminded me, me a lot of Zodiac, Brian. Uh, Again, I need, I need, <laughs> it, maybe once I watch Zodiac, I'll have a different perspective on this movie. I think the most interesting <laughs> idea in the Boston Strangler film is the idea that they come to at the end of the movie. Okay. And this is, I mean, spoilers for the real life investigation because mm -hmm. it is a theory that was put out there. Okay. But the idea that other people were copying the Boston Strangler yeah. to remove their girlfriends from their lives, their wives, their coworkers. It's a really dark, yeah. horrifying idea yeah. that never really got proved in real life. Okay, that's uh, what I was wondering. Yeah, but it was something that was put out there. I feel like if you did that movie and you removed the true element of the Boston Strangler, if you did like, you know, the St. Louis Strangler and you really explored that idea of people of copying, that's, a, that's something that I haven't seen executed before in a movie. Okay, so you're saying just remove kind of like the true life or the real life yeah, element I, I feel to like it. The, I feel then... like the true crime element of this movie Probably how the film got made, mm. but also gets in the way of the most interesting idea that's put out there at the very end of the film. Interesting. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, I, I like that point that you're making. I think it probably could work a little bit better like that, but it, it definitely worked for me, this, this particular movie. What's your rating for this one? Didn't work for me. I'm going B minus. Okay, okay. For me, I'm giving it a B plus for for everything that we've discussed about it. But yeah, that, I, I like the last point that you made. I think that'd be interesting to see. Um, those are our thoughts on Boston Strangler. So when we get back, we're uh, going inside with William Defoe. Stay right there. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Tell him that I'm stuck here. No one's come. Do that for me. here but us pigeons. Right? 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 Willem Dafoe asks a pigeon for help as he slowly descends into madness, trapped in a New York City penthouse in the new film Inside. That sounds like a Pixar film, Brian, but Inside is definitely not a Pixar movie. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's inside. He's not inside out. He's trying to get out, but he can't find his way out. I absolutely love the premise of this film. Yeah. An art thief who breaks into a penthouse. He wants to steal all these priceless works of art. Mm. And then the security system malfunctions, traps him inside. He's waiting for the police to come. They never do. He's stuck there for hours, days, weeks, months. Yeah, and we lose track, because it's funny watching a movie like this, you're trying to track how long he's been inside and stuck away in there, and like after a certain point, like we're actually, as an audience, are starting to get into the mind of the character, and as he's starting to kind of lose sight of how long he's been there, I think the audience is as well, and I think that's a great job from the direction to really put us in that same space that Willem Dafoe's character is in in the movie as well, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I think yeah. there is a big mystery to this film, and mm. the mystery is what's going on inside Willem Dafoe's head as he progresses through this nightmare. Yeah, It's really unsettling. Willem Dafoe is a titan of an actor, and he is so 
watchable. We talk about Andy Serkis being watchable. Oh, yeah. But this movie is really a testament to how much do you love Willem Dafoe because you are stuck with Willem Dafoe. And if you don't like what Willem Dafoe is doing, you are also trapped in this movie. But if you like what he's doing, mm. you're enthralled. Exactly. And that's how I was throughout the whole film. And it's interesting because we've seen movies like this before where you have a singular performance, like whether it's Tom Hanks in Castaway or Will Smith in I Am Legend. Even other movies like with Tom Hardy in Locke and even Ryan Reynolds in Barry. Yeah. But a movie like this, I think is more akin to I Am Legend and Castaway. But this is different because this really is just Willem Dafoe for literally about 98% and he like you're saying so enthralling so engaging just to watch his descent into madness and to see how that slowly progresses it's a tour de force to watch him watch his performance in this movie yeah and it's all shot chronologically which mm. is a gift to an actor that does not happen yeah. too often in movies most times yeah. movies are shot out of sequence for budgetary reasons uh, but this one, because over the course of the, however long he's in there, he is slowly destroying the set, they had to shoot uh, it chronologically. So Willem Dafoe, you know, he gets on set, he starts growing out his fingernails, starts growing out his beard, and, you know, wow. he starts aging and deteriorating along with the set, and wow. it's so gorgeous to watch. Interesting. Okay. You know and something else that I took away from this movie is it felt like... A co not not a COVID movie, but not as far as like the filmmaking of it, but just thematically in the story, felt like they were talking about the isolation, like the quarantine, like that idea. I just sure. it, it reminded me of like when we were locked down and that whole thing that a lot of people were talking about, that that sense of like wanting to connect with other people and like the isolation of it. And then we have that one scene with the maid where it, it may seem like it's in his head and how it's like, you know, he's, he's, it's almost like he's yearning for that touch. He's desperate for connection, and right? And he's desperate for that connection. And it just reminded me to that era when we were in quarantine and when we were isolated and it felt like it was speaking to some of those themes in this but I movie. also love this idea of an art thief who goes in to steal millions of dollars worth of paintings mm. then becoming imprisoned inside that building surrounded by all this priceless art that then becomes worthless because he needs water he needs food how do I open up these cans of tuna yeah. you know what happens when you cut yourself and there's no aid you know so really how much does art matter, matter. when your survival's at stake interesting and yeah. like i i was fascinated by the conversation that this movie is trying to have and i think there are many conversations yeah. that this movie's having yeah i actually had an opportunity to interview willem dafoe for film school rejects okay and we talked about what it was like to live that space and how he interacted with it and he is like a prop guy he loves playing with what's in his environment. Okay. And he doesn't believe in accessing emotion. He believes that the audience will get to that emotion through the performer by how they interact with the environment. So he just looks at what's in this room. Yeah. How would I get inside that tuna can? Okay. And in the act of getting inside that tuna can, we are, the audience, layering on what's going on inside his head. What's it go? Oh, interesting. I like that approach. That's yeah. an interesting approach as to how, especially spe specifically with this character. I like that. What's your uh, what's your rating for this one? I I loved this film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I give it a B, B plus. Yeah, same, same. I, I was, like you were saying, enthralled by his performance and just so focused in on his character. And it, yeah, it, it was B plus for me. I loved it. All right. So uh, those are our thoughts on Inside. So let's go ahead and recap what we have reviewed this week. Uh, 65, uh, I believe we both give that a B minus. Um, and then our next film, Luther, uh, the fall, uh, A Fallen Son, uh, we both give that a B minus as well. Uh, Boston Strangler, we split on that one. Brad gives that a B minus. I give that one a B plus. And Inside, uh, we both um, enjoyed this movie. We give this one a B plus, especially for Willem Dafoe's uh, performance in this. So. Those are our thoughts on this week's films. Thank you for joining us on this latest episode of BNB Movie Reviews. Come be a part of the conversation. If you have questions, suggestions, feel free to email us at bnbmoviereviews at gmail.com. And with that, 
We will see you at the movies.